Do you think there should be any concern of us making this documentary? If you don't realize right now that you're putting your neck on the chopping block, you better take that camera and throw it away. Let's look at the fundamental problem here. They're looking to maximize the number of people making contributions. No one wants to talk about it. There's suppression and mismanagement of information everywhere. It abounds. It starts at the local level, but then it goes all the way to Congress. When you consider the devastation it's having on our planet as well as the oceans, we're in the middle of the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. They can dictate the federal policies because they have so much political power. And one of the largest industries on the planet, the biggest environmental impact, trying to keep us in the dark about how it's operating. That's the one thing no one talks about. You know, everybody goes around that. A lot of people just keep their mouths shut because they don't want to. They don't want to be the next one with the bullet to their head. I don't know that I would want to comment on that. Can you just give us a little introduction to the project, how it came about, and what really happened as you began that journey? Uh, well, basically, I thought I was doing everything I could to help the environment after seeing um, you know, things like Inconvenient Truth, riding my bike, uh, taking short showers, doing this and that, the things that you hear um, all the time of what we can do to help the environment. And then I saw a post and some facts about how animal agriculture, eating animals for food, animal products for food, is the leading cause of human-caused greenhouse gases anywhere between, depending on how you actually compute it, anywhere between 14% to 18%, upwards of 51%. And the, the more deep you go into this, the, clo the more realistic it is to 51%, but it's a long, drawn-out way of computing what would happen if, the, if, if all the land would come back, what, what the restoration, the, the, essentially the lungs coming back, what that would produce. And a lot of these numbers that you see on the lower end, they don't take that into consideration because it's somewhat theoretical. Um, and then once I found that out, I dug deeper and found out that not only is it, is it the leading cause of human cause, greenhouse gases, but it's also the leading cause of water depletion, uh, water consumption, uh, water pollution. And we're in, I live in California where we're in a drought and you know, upwards of 55% of all water uses for, is for animal agriculture when only 5% is used for all domestic use. Only 5%, 55% is used for animal agriculture. Um, so taking short showers and all these things are essentially almost useless compared to not eating animal meat and dairy. And then also found out it's the leading cause of wildlife uh, extinction, coyotes, bears, wolves. Um, more wild horses are round up in the United States than are free on the range. And all these are being killed and being um, round up because of ranchers. Because you can't share land with cows. And this is not normal cows. is not necessarily uh, a bit important thing about this is we skip the part about factory farm. We go right into the real cause. The, 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 the worst part for most natural resources, especially wildlife, is it's actually, it's actually grass-fed and pasture-raised because when you have a factory farm, it's very efficient. You only have around two acres per, per cow to raise them. But when you have grass-fed and these pasture-raised, you're upwards of 10 acres to 50 to 70 acres for one single cow. And that cow cannot live with any other predators or any other animal that can share the land with them because it takes its precious water resources and the, the sparse food that's out there. And the list just goes on and on. And that's just <laughs> one, and that's the one-stop topic for everyone. And then the bottom line is, found out that the leading environmental organizations did not talk about it, Greenpeace and Sierra Club, and that's where the movie yeah. gets interesting, yeah. why they don't talk about it. Because there was a... Um... <laughs> I think it was the first interview that you conducted, you went to the Cali Californian Water Resources Department, spoke to two of the directors there, and you said, what can I do to you know, improve the planet? And they told you, you know, check your leaky taps, and you know, don't water your garden in the hot sun, and shorter showers, don't wash your car, and all those sorts of things. And then there's a point where you ask him about, is, that a, is animal agriculture a player in this? And he didn't want to talk about it. And then, 
So it seemed like your journey continued and no one wanted to talk about it. But there is a, a point in the film where you try to make contact with these agencies and from where I was sitting as a, viewing the film, when you managed to get access and many of them refused to even speak to you, those that did, they seemed completely clueless about the problem and others didn't really want to talk about it. So do you think that there's just a lack of information in certain departments, in certain organisations, as about the, the influence agriculture is having on the planet? It's a mix. Uh, the majority is that they actually do know about it. Uh, the NRDC, she was interviewed, she was a little bit ignorant of some of the facts, but uh, Greenpeace, kind of giving part of the movie away, but uh, they refuse to be interviewed because they absolutely know what's going on, and they have three separate sectors, one's on fishing, one's on rainforest, one's on um, uh, climate change, and they were going to have three different interviews, and they found out that we were just asking questions about animal agriculture, and they eventually, after promising us uh, to be interviewed, they refuse mm -hmm. because they know. They know they're not doing their job. They, not, they know that their main concern is getting more, as we say, profits over planet. They do a lot of good work, these organizations, but the majority of them, they're more concerned if their campaign is gonna be a win campaign. And since the making of this film, I'm probably even more passionate about the subject of these organizations not doing things, of, of finding out from people within the organizations. We got about a 20-page paper, marketing research paper, on if they would talk about um, consuming less animal products, would it be a win campaign? And the conclusion was no. So they you know, stopped it. And it's equivalent of, a, of going on to, say, in America, American Lung Cancer Association, and they decided that people weren't going to stop smoking cigarettes, so that we're just not going to tell you uh, that cigarette smoking is causing lung cancer. Um, it's, it's absolutely atrocious, and it's, mm -hmm. it's unacceptable. Yeah. So the, the film itself really tracks your personal journey, which is a beautiful thing about it. And, you know, it isn't dark and macabre. That's probably the most dramatic scene mm -hmm. of them all. And, you know, it's really about sustainability, isn't it? But you kind of chose to make it more about that, about the environment and the impact of that industry on the environment rather than looking at the ethical issues, although that comes into it. So was that a conscious decision you guys made? Uh, it was because we had some ethical, you know, there's a part at the end, it's a very comical health part um, of the journey I come into. Then it becomes, well, what can I do personally? And, you know, it's to essentially st liberate myself from this addiction of eating animal flesh and animal secretions that we're not meant to, which is a whole other subject. Um, but really doing it beyond, I, when, I, when I went vegan, I literally was so naive in the subject like a lot of people were. I literally thought I might die within a month. But I, I just, I, even if I did, I just wanted that, that path of blood and destruction and death and killing animals and everything in sight. I felt like Godzilla, at least could I have, you know, a month of peace where that just ended and I'd be liberated from that. Um, but once the, the decision really was, is that, you know, this is beyond just one person, it's beyond any individual, it's just global. You know, if we don't do anything about this, none of us are gonna evolve, we're not gonna get conscious because this is the one thing that's a one-stop shop for everything for the future. So it became more of a lo logical film where, you know, not everybody cares about animals or the ethics about that or their own health, but if you do A equals B, you know, if we continue on this path of eating animal products and, and animal flesh and, and dairy, we will not be around. So could you run us through why the animal agriculture industry is actually so damaging for the environment? Like, what are these dead zones that you talk about and, you know, by kill and deforestation? Like, how does all that work? That's, if you look at deforestation, for, for, for start there, for yeah, example. So that's the whole film. It takes a little while, but uh, for animal agriculture, say in the Amazon, upwards of 91% of all the destruction in the Amazon, 91% is caused for, um, is because of livestock. And so when a lot of people think soy, oh, soy goes to the vegetarians, upwards of 90% of all soy production goes to feed cows. And then the cows not only um, are feeding this, they're also then pasture raised, grass fed, raised in the Amazon. So sure, they clear the, 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 um, the rainforest initially, some people say it's for logging and for this, for, for timber, it would never be the situation if it wasn't for animal agriculture. How much um, so of the Amazon are they clearing? 
Um, it's upwards, you know, th this ranges depending on the year. And it went down, and ironically, last year, it skyrocketed again. Um, the worst it's ever been was up to, uh, um, I think, an acre, uh, acre a second? When, an acre or a second. Yeah, acre a second, I mean, think about that. Um, and most commonly, it's uh, around one to two acres per minute. And just when you think of that, you know, I'm not sure how big this place is, but of, of how much is in a rainforest or in anywhere. That? How do they do that in a second? Like, that, that's the thing. How does it do? And then like there's a good graph of it where you just show it just like boom, boom. And it's one second, a whole entire acre. And mm -hmm. imagine all the bio, all the life that's killed within that, that rainforest. You know, you think of the animals that are killed in, you know, 70 million um, 70 million to 100 million animals are killed, but they, you don't think of all these other animals that are killed from the byproducts of, of um, this industry. But there are some arguments that we need to feed the planet, and people need you know, animal protein to thrive. So um, what would your view be on that argument, that it's natural, traditional cultures have always eaten milk, it's been a part of all diets in all indigenous cultures predominantly. Yeah, so it's been, and we don't talk too much about this, but Keegan and I are in the process of making our next film. It's basically on health. Essentially the exact same thing is happening with, with uh, the mean dairy industry, what's happening, to, just doing to the environment. Almost the exact same thing is doing to our health. The leading cause of, of heart disease, Bre uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, many think that the leading cause and also of diabetes is from eating animal products, yet we're not told this. Um, so where's this protein myth come from? Well, we go into that and we see where this protein myth come from. It's been generational, you know, not, it's, it's not our first generation, it's been many generations that has been pounded into our consciousness that we literally think that we need protein from a dead animal when we don't realize the strongest animal on earth and that we're almost closest related to is chimpanzee and then gorillas. A chimpanzee, I think, is 16 times stronger than us. So what happened? You know, what happened? Uh, the strongest animal on the planet, pound for pound, is a gorilla. Protein myth, it's not where you get your protein, it's where can I l get less protein. Almost most all illnesses are caused from too much animal protein. So you, the, the lower you have that, they're seeing all these studies, the more likelihood you are for health. So that seems to be that, you know, the, the film moves in that direction of looking at, you know, what the leading cause is. And it's not really industry, it's the, cons the consumers that are really fueling the industry, because if everyone tomorrow said, you know, I'm just gonna, uh, you know, eat a plant-based diet, we'd sign the industry would change quite dramatically. Um, so if we don't have knowledge, then it's easy to continue to do what we do. So I imagine the film would be confronting for many people. Have you found that? It's been confronting, but the most that we've found, at least what we've found, is it's really liberating. I mean, it's kind of, it's funny how people, it's, even in life, either you don't want to see something, you don't want to know the truth, or there's other people who embrace the truth and they embrace, they embrace authenticity, you know, of who you really are as a core person. If you really are the spiritual person or what you want to do, you want to really search for that next level that can take you. So we've just seen so many beautiful stories of, 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 of really, a, 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 the best word is liberation, and liberating yourself from this, from, from this, this just deadly, bloody, you know, barbaric system that's gone on for way too long. And it's one of the most, not only revolutionary acts, it's the most evolutionary acts and rebellious acts. You know, what's more rebellious than, than going against an industry that you've basically been, you've been bonded to through several generations that's been killing not only your family, I'm sure everyone here has had some relatives been you know, died of some sort of disease caused by animal, eating too much animal protein, um, but then the entire planet. And so we've just heard just beautiful stories of finally now, you know, I have that last section of, of knowledge of, uh, to let myself completely go, and then they just feel incredible. You know, like mm -hmm. I said, it, it, I thought I was gonna die, but within one month I felt better than I ever had in my entire mm -hmm. life. And for me it was mainly getting rid of dairy. I mean, that's, that's the addicting one. So when you look at you know, this film and it's really creating a movement, it's opening up a whole conversation that people really weren't having before, which is incredible, so well done. Uh, you see, I can draw parallels with Blackfish, and those of you who haven't seen Blackfish, it's the story of basically the, the orcas that are in captivity in SeaWorld. And that particular film, there's literally been millions of people who have campaigned 
to actually change legislation so now orcas aren't allowed to breed in captivity anymore. Um, so it seems that that started as you know this unknown film and then and then what happened to that and it seems like your your film's going on the same direction because it's just been released on Netflix. Yeah. So we had a big push. The film came out almost a year and a half ago, but not until it came out on Netflix, which I guess Netflix is starting to get more popular here in the US it's huge. Mm. Same thing out with Blackfish. Once that up became on CNN, boom, that's when the wildflower fire started and it, it doesn't go away because the truth is the truth, you know. There's only what do they say only few things you can hide is the, um, was it the sun and the truth? Mm -hmm. Something else, yeah. Um, but so now you can just see it happening. You can see it happening, the mm -hmm. buzz of this whole, I guess you'd say a movement of um, activism within the environmental communities that need to take the role, because mm -hmm. they're the ones that we look up to. We're not looking up to the animal agriculture industry mm -hmm. to tell us the truth, just as we're not looking to, to the tobacco industry. And it's already happening. Greenpeace is already starting to put out, just in the past few weeks, Greenpeace uh, UK in another Greenpeace article directly referring to cowspiracy. But the one thing is they put out an article and says, yes, it is all true, and they put out all of these lists. And they say, we were gonna misrepresent them like we did other organizations, which the more you see of any of these interviews, the more um, it's actually worse than it appears. Mm -hmm. But it's great to see that they're finally addressing this. But until it's on their, their homepage as one of their core subjects, they're failing their jobs miserably. Mm -hmm. And right now they've put those two articles that I said that addresses animal agriculture. You can literally go on Greenpeace or our Sierra Club, and you will not find this. If you, if, you, you know, if you go in the search tab, you could probably find it, but you literally cannot find this through searching through their website. And these are the organizations who are meant to be protecting the planet, right? They're safeguarding it. Yeah, these are the ones protecting our planet. But um, it's happening. It's happening quick, though. Yeah, and you're stimulating conversation. Um, so when I uh, you know, met you today, it seems like you're someone who has a lot of inner calm, very easygoing, very laid back like us Australians. So um, I'm curious about what your personal philosophy, life philosophy is, if you have one, you know. What is it that motivates you to do what you do each day? To get on a plane, come to Australia, to the other side of the world? Um, I guess really, you know, uh, uh, a big one like Keegan says is justice. And a lot of, for Keegan as well, is, is not only for the planet, for you know, our future, is it's justice for the animals. And it's not even that I, it's just like Keegan, it's funny, he doesn't even like animals. Uh, as like an animal lover, I'm an animal lover. It's that, especially with the animals, they just deserve justice. And there's literally, when people say, you know, certain walks of life of humans, they have no voice, these, these animals truly have no voice. Mm. They don't speak our language, yet they do internally in their emotions. Um, and then the planet, you know, Mother Earth Gaia, she, does, she cannot speak. She speaks so, so clear. If you just listen, you just listen to the truth. She's screaming out. Just look at the paper, look everything around and go deep, deep soul searching and searching deep on the internet, on the Google. All these facts are found on simple Google searches. And so really just sharing the message of, um, you know, we want us to have a future and mm. justice for the animals. And what are some of those facts that you were searching? Because they're quite mind-blowing. And, and the first time I, I watched the film, it was, it was overwhelming how much data there was in the film. And when I watched it again, like, my jaw continued to drop. So can you recall some of the factors, like, for example, the equivalencies between a burger and a shower, for example? Yeah, so with water, and again, water shortage is a huge issue in California. Um, it takes upwards of 660 gallons of water to produce one, I don't know, that hamburger. liters, uh, to produce one hamburger. And so essentially it's the equivalent of eating one hamburger is the equivalent of not showering or showering for two entire months. And then um, to talk about dairy, how inefficient dairy is, it takes one liter of milk takes upwards of a thousand gallons of water. I mean, that is just, it's, it's unbelievable. And then uh, the, uh, the issue, again, that, that's really personal to me is the wildlife and uh, finding about how all the wolves were, are, are killed and round up and they're killed, mm. as you see in the film, because um, I thought they were just going extinct for whatever other reason. I didn't know it was for, for ranching. You know, like, again, a lot of this, most of this is, is, is grass-fed, free-range, that's killing all, now, all the bison in Yellowstone, and the list mm. goes on and on. Mm. 
And it seems not, that there's no real exemptions. You, you know, okay, you don't eat meat, but you, have, you, you consume dairy products. And then you go, okay, well, I, but it's all right, I eat fish. And then there's the massive fallout from that too. And then you go, okay, I just eat eggs. And then you just basically were... <laughs> it's one after I know. Well, that's the thing. I was, I, I'm looking for a way that I can, you know, ethically and sustainably eat animal products, and it just they just keep falling apart. And one thing about fishing, that's an incredible stat, is for every pound of fish that almost anyone eats, you there's a five for every pound of fish, there's upwards of five pounds of bikill. And what bikill is, is um, you know, most all fishing, I don't know what percentage, huge majority of fishing is all done by these huge nets. And for every pound of, say, you have salmon, there's upwards of, uh, uh, or shrimp or whatever, five, upwards of five pounds of sea turtles, sharks, dolphins, and all bikill that you won't even see on your plate that all gets killed. And what happens and, to that bikill? Uh, that goes, gets, then a lot of that bikill goes to be fed to pigs and cows, and I believe pigs eat more fish than all humans combined. And some say dairy cows too. And then the big thing too is again, we skip past the part of, uh, you know, there's a funny part in the film is when we interview Oceana, the term sustainable fishing is a complete joke. Um, the, there's no way to feed 7.2 billion, 7.5 billion with any type of fishing. And if there is, you know, again, we wish this film was three hours because going deep into it, the bottom line is to feed fish or to get that much fish out of an ocean, there's no possible way to do it. So sustainable fishing, they'll have, rather than a net, they'll have thousands and thousands of, of drag lines because you can have hooks. And it's doing the exact same thing. You know, it's, 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 if anything, it's probably more brutal because it's, you know, you have hooks going into mm -hmm. sharks and dolphins. Um, so <laughs> these, these myths of grass-fed and these myths of Alan Savory, which is a complete, complete joke, of, of intensive grazing, which is another subject, and sustainable fishing. It's just all a fallacy for people who want to somehow rationalize this addiction. Mm. And it's a very powerful word, an addiction. Um, <laughs> and it's a very challenging thing, I think, when you people tell people, hey, um, here is the, the impact of your, your eating habits. Your film really doesn't do that, though. It just more presents facts, which I love about it, and then people can come to their own conclusions, but right. do so consciously. And, and, for, and for me, when I found out, when I, you know, we started interviewing a lot of doctors in this film, we only have one, is to find out that I was addicted. I didn't need it. For me, that was liberating, because I didn't need it. I was just mm -hmm. addicted, you know, and in, in, in um, dairy products, why there's so many vegetarians, not as many vegans, is in dairy products you have something called casomorphine. Morphine. It's one of the most addicting drugs there is, and um, people can have huge, uh, you know, withdrawals from it. And mm. I was hardcore addicted to dairy, mm. and I didn't know it. I just thought I needed it, but I had probably more cheese than anyone I know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's the whole thing about being liberated, for, just by being liberated from any drug. The feeling to be liberating from something that you don't even know that you're addicted to is just the most incredible feeling in the world. And then to, uh, for me too, I was explaining this earlier, to be reconnected, a total bonus that I didn't know was gonna happen, I was reconnected to my inner child. My inner child, you know, five, six years old, um, would never kill an animal, would never take a baby from its mother, would never contribute to any of this. And once, about three to six months after I became vegan, um, this weird feeling, because I, I do meditation too in yoga, mm. I had this solidifying of almost my complete being becoming present again, where I had this disconnect that I didn't even know I had, where, where I put this inner child away and then came back, came back as one, where I'm living again as authentically as I possibly can from the day I'm born of who my moral values are, of who I want to be in 20 years, and of course, mm -hmm. still working on it, long ways to go. But that was a really cool bonus that yeah. happened. Yeah, amazing. And we've got to roll on with the show, but thanks for coming. Right thanks on. for Thank sharing you your so message, much. man. It's um, okay. important. Thanks, brother. Thank you. <laughs>